So welcome everybody to Digital U, our digital literacy continuing education opportunity. Um, Jennifer Fenton is usually our facilitator. She is uh, out on the road right now doing a lot of trainings uh, around the state, so she's not in. Uh, instead, you have me for technical support and facilitation and all around nice guy. Well, I hope people will say that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is brought to you by the Washington Secretary, uh, Office of the Secretary of State, Washington State Library Division, uh, and with support from the Institute of Museum Library Services LSTA funds. And uh, real quick for tracking, um, oh, hey, Darcy, welcome. Uh, for tracking purposes, we need to ask where everyone is from. Uh, and if you have multiple people attending from, the, from your site, please let us know. Thank you, Darcy. Marjorie, I'm going to go ahead and type in that you were from New Jersey again, just so we have it for tracking purposes. And Griffin, uh, we haven't heard anything from you. Are you there? time to enter it in as we go along. Um, we'll, we'll move right into technology pushback. Uh, Griffin, yes, you raised your hand. I didn't cover how to talk earlier. Oh, it's missing on this picture. Give me one second. So if you're new to Blackboard, down here in the bottom is a, a bar. You can just click in to type. Press enter and your message will appear in the chat room. If you have a microphone and would like to use your microphone, you can press the talk button up top here. We do ask that, like Griffin is doing right now, you raise your hand by pressing this button before you before you do use the microphone, however. Uh, typing, feel free to type the entire time. Elizabeth, welcome. We just went through the credits real quick. We're asking individuals to type their name and where they are uh, from. And if you have any additional individuals uh, attending from your, your station there. Atlanta. Hmm. So moving along, we have Stacy Morrison. Uh, she's going to be covering pushback and technology today. Uh, Stacy, I apologize, I didn't get a uh, intro paragraph. I thought Jennifer would be here today to cover that. So if you okay. want to say a little bit about yourself and the session before you actually get started, uh, I'll leave that up to you. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough, uh, Jeremy. All right. Well, uh, I work now at the University of Washington uh, at the medical school. Uh, I'm working in the coordination of the family clerkship um, medical program. Um, in terms of pushback, there is ongoing uh, work being done at the information school here at the UW. Uh, Ricardo Gomez is uh, spearheading that work. I was working with him on it uh, with a number of PhD students and Kirsten Foote, who is a uh, faculty member and um, but, but in the communications department. And she actually coined the phrase pushback. Uh, so she's working now with Ricardo, and they are investigating images of pushback, uh, internet images, and how people are uh, portraying um, pushback through visual images. So it should be a very interesting paper that's coming up. Also, if you were to Google Kirsten Foote, I imagine if it hasn't ha happened yet, it's going to happen soon. She has a paper that is sort of the historical perspective on this movement. And uh, that's being published in a major um, paper, uh, yes, as a major paper in a uh, oh. uh, academic journal. So um, pushback is the growth of expressions of resistance to constant online ca connectivity. Um, what does that mean exactly? I'll go forward and I'll talk about Adam Gopnik. Adam Gopnik, about three years ago in The New Yorker, talked about three types of tech people, um, never betters, better nevers, and the ever wathers. Uh, he said that people fall who use technology on a regular basis, particularly people who work with technology, fall into one of the three categories. He said that uh, some people are like, this is the greatest thing that ever happened, um, and they're the never betters. Uh, the better nevers are people who are sort of more Luddite type people and who were like, who think this, that in a way 
technology is a terrible thing. It's going to cost us in terms of our humanity. And the ever wazers are people who said, hey, you know, this is just another type of technology, um, not unlike other technologies that we've had. Um, and, you know, comparing it to inventions like the printing press, or the vacuum cleaner, these are just things that people uh, thought were horrible, horribly going to change uh, humanity's uh, perception of the world. And in fact, they were a mixed bag. In some ways, they were, uh, the printing press obviously was a wonderful thing, uh, but it was also uh, used initially for a lot of political reasons uh, to create all kinds of havoc. Um, the vacuum cleaner is a great invention. It cleans. It does this amazing job compared to a broom. And yet, because the vacuum cleaner uh, cleans so well, our standard of cleanliness has risen to such a degree that we're constantly trying to clean better. And so there's actually more pressure on people in terms of their um, their household cleanliness. So, you know, inventions always have a, uh, a upside and a downside. It's, it's kind of what the ever the ever wazers are going to say. Uh, we investigated, we did basically a literature review, and we investigated blogs, we investigated um, uh, academic sources, um, and we found that the blogs are some of the richest information on the subject because people are writing about uh, how they feel about technology using technology. Uh, and they are, they're reaching out to other people to talk about it. Um, in this case, this, uh, this young man, is a, uh, he's an engineer, and on his blog, he's asking questions like, he's talking about the addiction aspect of it, that he feels, uh, a lot of people have asked, why don't you just use it less? He says, I think that's sort of like asking a crack addict, why don't you just put the crack in the closet and do less blow? Um, so he's comparing his use of his smartphone to, um, to obviously, to cocaine. Um, a Harvard Business School study found that 70% of people check their smartphones within an hour of waking up, and 56% of people check their smartphones within an hour of going to sleep. Another study found that 40% of people check their smartphones while sitting on the toilet. Um, so this is an interesting visual image. Um, I don't actually think this is part of the upcoming study, but uh, it gives you some perspective because it's, I think we've all done these things. Um, the blog, uh, a blog that was from a Google project manager, uh, and he was anonymous on this source, um, he says that he's wrestling with the fundamental struggle over the meaning of friendship and acquaintance because of social media. He's having doubts about what he really, what friendship truly is and whether or not he's really connecting with people. And this is an overriding theme in uh, people's pushing back against technology. Uh, primarily, we studied, um, we studied a lot of social media, uh, Facebook, um, in particular, because it's so widely used. Um, we also looked at the blogs, of course, because they're so widely used. Um, and uh, we'll see some of the other um, aspects of this. Uh, an interesting aspect in the media was this account of a Facebook suicide. Stephanie Painter's death was swift and painless. At 9.10 p.m. on February 11th, she bid her 121 Facebook friends goodbye with one last poke, mood sorrowful, then left the virtual world peacefully with a quick click of the mouse. Um, obviously, this is just a social media, quote, suicide. Uh, some people have actually taken it to much greater lengths. Uh, we, uh, I've read about people who literally um, uh, not only logged off Facebook, um, but other, but all their sources from Instagram, you know, to Twitter, and made sure they actually had people change their passwords so they couldn't possibly go back. Um, those people are are you know withdrawing entirely, but in this case, um, she's just withdrawing from Facebook. I'm just gonna. 
Uh, newer articles supported by research studies suggest pushback is a result of stress. And some of the academic papers in the past had suggested that digital natives are um, uh, people who are, you know, who grew up with this technology don't really suffer stress. But um, other academic studies have refuted that. And people, teenagers, have claimed uh, to feel addicted. They've claimed that they feel stressed, uh, that they, they're aware of how compulsive their behavior has become. This is a common um, theme, with, particularly with younger people. Uh, we saw over and over and over again that cell phone addiction is, uh, is, is how they often talk about their technology problem. They see it as a problem, and they see it as an addiction. Some of the pushback, in terms of the academics, the pushback discussion probably started about 2003. And then it was more about just general ICT, information and communication technologies um, use. Um, this is kind of long before, well, maybe not long before, but Facebook was, was certainly not uh, that prevalent if it was even around at that time. Um, in 2005, we have a, a very important and often cited study filtering and withdrawing strategies for coping with information overload in everyday context. That's probably the definitive uh, early academic paper on this. Um, he discusses withdrawing and filtering as the two primary behaviors that people engage in. They either um, withdraw entirely, uh, which would be the case of somebody who gets out of every type of social media um, and then has their friend change the password so they can't possibly go back. Um, or you have people who do filtering, which is, of course, a much more common occurrence where people find ways to limit or control their use of technology. So we essentially we looked at two things. We looked at motivations and what people were saying, and we looked at behaviors. The National Day of Unplugging has become a very popular um, occurrence. It usually takes place in March. And Reboot is the organization that uh, organizes it. It's become a global phenomenon. And people will have like a sign. And we'll probably see, I can't remember now, but I believe we'll see other images of this, where people hold up a sign and say, I unplug to connect with friends, or I unplug to spend time with my family. Um, and they take these shots, and they're put up on the, on the unplug, um, National Day of Unplugging website. It originally started as a religious um, thing. It was um, a Jewish organization that started this uh, yearly event. And it has since um, sort of been become something that's international and not necessarily attached to a religion. Uh, Jennifer Roach, professor at Long Island University in New York, um, talks about the slow media movement. And that's kind of a, that's part of a historical perspective. It was originally, pushback was originally thought of as the slow media movement. Um, and she talks about this, um, there was on National Public Radio, promoting the idea of de detoxing or unplugging. Uh, in most cases, they're not talking about people permanently, you know, never using technology or anything of that nature. It's more like, you know, not using um, on certain days, uh, taking Sabbaths from, uh, from technology. Um, you know, some people are like, actually scheduling it into their weekly or monthly uh, calendar. On this Sunday, I, I'm not opening the laptop. I'm not uh, charging the phone. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be available. 
we saw a lot of very funny images about uh, slow media and unplugging. One of the great things about the um, pushback images is many of them are really, really, really funny. Um, in terms of the, we looked also in terms of academic papers, there wasn't uh, as much as we had hoped to find. And so we had to go outside the discipline and look at things um, from, uh, such as the APA papers, from uh, psychology papers, where sometimes uh, that some of the best input on these societal trends could be found. Um, they found that um, one of the things about Facebook is that it can be an overly tempting coping mechanism for lonely for the lonely, and that in the end they feel disconnected, and they don't. It doesn't actually relieve their loneliness because in in fact they put too much weight on it. People who people who are outgoing and gregarious seem to get the most out of Facebook um, because they don't they see it as a tool but it's not a major part of their lives or a lot of lonelier people who don't have a lot of social connections um, put too much weight on on using social media and then they're um, disappointed. We also looked in medical journals, uh, such as El and we looked in El Elsevier. Um, one of these was a really great study because it was so uh, such a large sample and it was such a diverse sample. And in this study, um, the paper establishes uh, internet addiction as a real affliction. This was uh, a very recent paper. This is one of the images that we used in, um, in that we're going to be that we, we talk about in the, the new paper. Another part of a uh, strange part of social media is mourning. Um, there's been online memorials providing opportunity for public sort of wailing at a virtual wall turning grieving into a kind of uh, spectator sport. And in fact, I have a friend who specifically um, logged off Facebook exactly for this reason. Uh, he was, a friend of his had died in a avalanche. Um, uh, he, well, I don't know if it was an avalanche, but he was a, he was a mountaineer and, he, and they, they, he disappeared. And then they found their bodies later. Um, and so when he went to that page of mourning on Facebook, he found people who seemed to get almost a um, vicarious thrill of some kind constantly posting to this site. And they were people, uh, in, his est in his estimation, that hardly knew this person or, or didn't know them at all. Um, and he found it sort of just plain creepy. This is a, uh, an example of how people use it in a positive way. Um, after the death of Casey Feldman, many of her friends changed their photographs to include Facebook profiles, and this created a sense of unity. So in that sense, social media can be uh, a way of people um, recognizing something together and working together, um, feeling like uh, connecting, like that they have some sort of connection. Uh, another interesting aspect of um, Facebook, um, and I'm sure this is also true of other social media like Instagram, for instance, is that um, they found that there's uh, that envy is a problem. Uh, people have a tendency to post the good stuff, of course, and they post their vacation shots, and this makes and things of that nature, and these and people feel um, they, they see that, they feel like they're a loser because they're not going anywhere fun. Um, they, they post their new promotion and people envy that. 
Uh, so some people have uh, pulled away from it because it creates uh, in, in them a sense of envy and uh, discontent. Uh, and there's also a tendency for people to exaggerate and um, to compensate for feeling um, not good about their lives by, uh, by exaggerating and even creating false profiles um, in order to paint themselves as much more successful or interesting um, than they are. Uh, in terms of the youth, the studies that have been done on the youth, uh, Common Sense Media uh, did a very uh, extensive study, a uh, survey of uh, 1,030 social media natives. And the researchers noted the beginnings of what might be Facebook, Facebook fatigue, with a substantial number of the teens um, stating they wish they could unplug. Now, overall in the study, they, many of the teens, you know, gushed about, they really loved their smartphones, they really loved the social media, but um, they also talked about uh, feeling um, overwhelmed by it. So in terms of breaking it down into uh, motivations, we found that they fell into five categories. Uh, emotional dissatisfaction uh, was uh, very prevalent. Um, in this case, this is an anon anonymous project manager, Google, who said uh, Facebook de detracted from the genuine catching up that happened when I actually ran into somebody, someone from the past. I love the mystery of running into people and learning about where they've been directly from them rather than from a secondary feed of snippets and status updates from their manually manually curated Facebook profiles. So this was not an uncommon uh, theme. People feeling like social media is a is is not true connection. External values was another um, common uh, reason for people pushing back. This is for political, religious, or moral reasons. Uh, we saw many um, examples of religious reasons where people on blogs talked about their faith and that they felt that they were um, cheating their families by not really spending time and energy on them. Um, Sherry Turkle talks about this. Sherry Turkle is kind of one of the great, the largest and most important voices on this subject. And she talks about it. She's out of MIT. And she says that she had, when she wrote her book about the subject, she anticipated that parents would talk about their, their teenagers being constantly on their phones and withdrawing using social media to connect with their peers and, and really disconnect from the family. And to her surprise, she found the opposite in that many times the complaints were from the young people that their parents were constantly on their phones, that they craved real connection with their parents and to be able to talk to them about things, but they were constantly distracted by um, being either on their laptop or on their phone, um, often for work purposes. So what you see with the external values is people often sort of um, recognizing that their constant distraction is stealing away uh, time and energy uh, from more important things. Uh, the political aspects were often more about people feeling that they're um, they're being surveyed, sur you know, surveillance, surveillance. Pardon me, surveillance. Uh, that you know that they are Facebook and other uh, social media. Google um, is constantly Amazon is constantly monitoring you, and that your um, 
You're sort of giving away your freedom. Taking back control is a separate theme in that people found that they wanted to regain control of their time and energy. So they don't necessarily have a moral issue with technology or feel that it's robbing them uh, of, of their uh, values, but rather that it's just taking up way too much time. This is a very funny um, drawing from, uh, I think this accompanied the, Jer the Jennifer Roach article on uh, the online publication transformations. The fourth motivation, and this was again the one that we heard from the young people most of all, was a sense of feeling addicted and that there was a dependency. I clearly am addicted and the dependency is sickening, said one student in the study. I feel like most people these days are in a similar situation for between having a Blackberry, a laptop, a television, and an iPod, people have become unable to shed their media skin. This was taken directly from uh, the ICMPA 2010 study. This could uh, definitely be sort of the, a good example of how some of the political people, some of the people who feel that it's compromising their values, see the see a pushback. Uh, privacy. Privacy was really uh, um, the fifth uh, motivation. Users pushing back due to fear of their privacy being violated. Um, this was not as we'll talk about. I'll talk about this in more detail later. But this was not as common a uh, motivation as you would think. In terms of behavior adaptation, um, this is probably the most and we're going to look uh, at this further, but this is probably the most common way people have managed technology. Um, this, um, this is from the Freedom, Fiend, Freedom Fiends my, uh, a podcast. Uh, I'm not leaving the internet. I love the internet. I've been on it since 1990, and I'm still going to be around. Uh, in this case, this girl said, I just hate Facebook. You can find me on Twitter. You can find and she gives all these places you can find her. So some people are pulling away by just uh, removing themselves from one type of social media. Uh, some people are um, limiting it by time, um, certain days they're not going. Um, they're not going on to social media at all. Um, there's different ways that people are finding to limit their use or schedule their use. Uh, there's even digital detox camps where people go specifically just to get away from technology. Um, social agreement is an interesting uh, behavior. Uh, we saw people making collective decisions to limit media use. Okay, an example of this, of course, is the National Day of Unplugging. Uh, but sometimes it's a, it's a place like this cafe where you go, if you're going to this cafe, you are not supposed to use your phone. It's, you know, it's just not done. Um, some restaurants have actually given um, incentives to their patrons to leave their cell phones in a basket by the door or leave them with the, uh, con you know, the, um, the host. And uh, can actually, in some cases, uh, have reduced um, cost, you know, a 5% off the, the bill, for instance. This is an example of the National Day of Unplugging, um, one of the many pictures that is put on the site by um, just people who are participating. This is uh, an a real life example of somebody of a place, uh, this was actually in Beirut, um, where you get 10% off your meal if you uh, 
give them your cell phones. We saw a lot of these type of images um, where people are now, it's become sort of in bad taste to, uh, at a wedding, for instance, to uh, have your phones. Um, even though a lot of people use phones for picture taking, um, in this instance, they're, they're saying that they really want them, everybody to be fully present. And they want the cameras and the phones to be um, kept away until the reception. So a lot of this is just actually it's becoming uh, quite common. Uh, tech solutions. This is a really interesting one. Some people have just downgraded to from a smartphone to, say, a flip phone. Um, this person, when it came to my smartphone, I felt like it was something I could and should do without. So this blogger had just downsized to a, a flip phone. Other people, there's a, um, there are phones now uh, called kosher phones that are being used widely in Israel. And the kosher phones are interesting because they were, I think, I believe they're originally Android phones, but they've disabled Google on the phone. And some of them have text capability because the, um, the users, there's been such a, a need for texting in terms of business reasons, but uh, some of them, um, you can't text on them either because they feel that it's um, potential, you know, sexting and potential, um, there could be just potential, you know, abuse that violates religious doctrine. Um, I think a lot of the phones also have something built in so that they are not usable during the Sabbath. So they're, they're really interesting, and they're, they're actually being manufactured uh, for that purpose. These are uh, examples of some of the um, um, kosher phones. Uh, another type of behavior is back to the woods. That's dropping off completely of technology. Um, for instance, in this example, um, this family therapist uh, helped this mother um, and um, by completely removing the computer and the uh, Game Boy from the house. And after the kids got over the initial shock, um, it was this great thing. The kids actually acknowledged that it was that that they gained from it, that they got to play outdoors and they had this whole other life that they hadn't really been living anymore. Um, however, in this case, in this particular case, I think they had a point incentive that if they did lots of chores, they could eventually get a certain amount of time on the uh, game machines. Uh, but it was such a high bar that for the most part, it would take a, so much for the boys to get there that they, um, it wasn't a huge uh, incentive. Uh, there's um, unplugged travel adventures now for families. This has become um, a marketing technique. Again, this is from the uh, National Day of Unplugging. And the last behavior is um, is no problem, whatever it takes. And we did see, we felt we needed to give voice to the people who think that it's just a lot of nonsense. Um, Alexander Samuel from the Harvard Business Review says, if longer term digital fast can remind you how to integrate offline moments back into your daily life, that's great. But you don't need a digital fast to justify meeting your needs online. And you don't need to unplug in order to justify plugging back in. So she's basically saying that all of this is um, sort of a fad and that um, it's a lot of noise signifying nothing. Um, this was an interesting aspect. Paul Miller uh, is a technology writer and he um, pulled away for a solid year uh, and didn't use the internet, which is kind of a radical thing to do for somebody who writes about technology. Uh, but in the end, um, 
he ends up being back, coming back to it. And he gave the example of his, um, I believe it was his niece, that she had posted pictures to Facebook that he never saw, and she, she was hurt by that, thinking that he just didn't care. And she, he came to the conclusion that um, the Internet isn't an individual pursuit. It's something we do with each other. The Internet is where people are. David Levy at the UW's Information School. He's been there many years now. He's a senior professor. And he's done a lot of work with um, contemplation and basically using meditation as a way of controlling and um, uh, relieving some of the stress of constant online connectivity and has also um, he, he teaches a class in this um, every quarter, I think almost every quarter. And it was actually just, um, he was just interviewed in USA Today on Sunday. So the April 20th um, USA Today, you can find an article about David Levy. And this was sort of uh, considered silly or radical, um, I think, when he started it. But it's become increasingly um, I think increasingly acknowledged as a, a real concern that people are having physical symptoms, emotional symptoms of being constantly online or constantly um, reachable. And that it's okay for people to find a way to um, relieve that tension and to acknowledge it and to limit limit it in whatever ways they can. All right, so that's the end of my talk. Um, I'd be open to any questions um, or any comments. Jeremy, you still there? there? Yes. Um, I see Elizabeth is typing, so I was waiting to see what she said. Uh -huh. I also made a comment earlier. Um, my fiance actually uh, got frustrated with Facebook and just quit cold turkey about 15 months ago or so. And other than having me post something really irregularly to her friends on there, hey, can you just get in touch with so and so on Facebook? She's totally ignored Facebook things this entire time. It's been kind of uh, interesting to see and. Um, I keep having to pass her tidbits that are going on because she doesn't pay attention at all. I barely do, I'll admit. But, you know, um, if we did pay any attention, most of our friends just assume that you're paying attention and that's where they put all their event postings nowadays. It really drives me crazy. So, Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a real problem for a lot of people, right? Because it's like people don't even send out invitations anymore. They just put it on Facebook, right? Yeah, I, I can't tell, or I can't tell you how many events that people were kind of frustrated with me for skipping, but I didn't know about them. It's like, well, we invited you on Facebook, um, which is really what they did is they opened it up to everyone sort of thing. And yeah. if you don't specifically point out something to me, so it sends me a message, I have no clue, I don't pay attention to it. You know, I just, I don't have time for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I see it also with a lot of young, uh, like my son's generation, you know, people who are, you know, under 25. Um, a lot of them are um, using Instagram almost really more than Facebook because it's all about the pictures. You know, or they're using Twitter. But I think it's just, it's just, you know, it's just tra trading one social media thing for another because now Facebook has become yeah, so. old, for old people. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually kind of the... Uh, my understanding of Facebook has gotten a little bit older. I think 35 is the median age, which is exactly how old I am. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, I, I'm really 
seen a lot of trend with my friends. Uh, even though they have Facebook, they do use it every now and then. Um, the younger friends are the ones that are doing the events. I was just talking about the older friends. You know, the uh. people in their 30s are starting to shut it all together and move away. And I've spent probably 12 hours on the phone just chit-chatting with friends in the last couple of weeks. And I'm not really a big phone talker. But uh, I, I've noticed people moving back to older technologies as where I mean, it was still a smartphone in this case, but, you know, actual voice communication as opposed to, you know, typing up a, some quick little message and posting it out there and hoping somebody notices it. Yeah, yeah. So I see yeah, I think there's... Typing. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think there's going to be quite a bit more on this subject. Um, there's... Um, the UW's, um, you know, uh, Ricardo Gomez, uh, who I wrote this, you know, who was my mentor in writing this paper, and um, uh, the two of us worked on it. He's all, he's going to um, he's got a, a team now of PhD students that he's working with, and Ann Kirsten um, put. So I think it's, there's going to be quite a bit more um, from the iSchool about this. Well, I look forward to seeing more of it. I, I'm, I'm definitely interested in the idea of pushback. I don't think I can – I've never really gone with the unplugging day, but uh, I I have mostly business needs for my phone being around all the time. And it is, I'm constantly sure. working with uh, consulting and the like. So uh, it's difficult for me to just set everything down and leave it alone. I, I won't deny that there is a day or two that on the weekends I tend to ignore my phone. Um, as much as possible, unless there's a, unless I have a client or something like that that I'm trying to, to talk to and work with on something. So, well, the um, the National Day of Unplugging is always from like sundown on a Saturday to sundown on a I mean sundown on a Saturday to sundown on a Sunday. So maybe you could work that in. Sunday is the day I typically do ignore my phone. So I mean I, I probably uh, unintentionally. <laughs> Fun, so. <laughs> Gone with on National Unplugging Day, just didn't realize it. <laughs> the really ironic thing is, without my phone, I don't know what the, uh, the calendars or anything like that. I'm horrible about paying attention to what day it is, and so I wouldn't even notice that it was National Unplugging Day if I weren't paying attention to my phone calendar that day. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> does uh, Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Margie, I saw you, you were typing earlier. Uh, where can we go to uh, really keep up on what's going on with all this? Is there um, a couple of good resources that would that uh, are constantly putting out new information? Uh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, they had pre they uh, Ricardo presented this paper um, uh, at the I conference, uh, but I don't think they post the um, the papers. So I really think that uh, it's it's really something you kind of at this point it's not organized, and um, I think it's going to be a matter of you of checking. Well, the UW has a um, you know on the UW website they they regularly post their new uh, research, not just for the I school but for um, all kind aspects of the school because uh, the University of Washington is is a leading research facility. So there may be information there, but I think it's just going to be kind of it's going to be kind of something that you have to sort of Google search and um, and see what comes up, um, or even use you know databases like um, IEEE because those you know the more um, sophisticated like academic databases um, will have more studies on this. But in terms of stuff that's more accessible and more um, Less academic and just more, you know, uh, media sort media uh, related. I think that that's just we're just going to have to see what happens. I do think Kirsten Foot is going to be doing more work on it, and I think Ricardo is going Ricardo Gomez is going to be doing more work on it. And those names will come up, and you'll be able to um, to see the work. Um, this paper, 
is we're just uh, revising it slightly, and it's going to be in um, a publication online called First Monday. Uh, not this, not this month, maybe even not next month, but uh, as soon as we finish the revisions, that should be published. And um, you can find the original version of this on my website, which is uh, uh, slmorrison.com. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thanks everybody, and I uh, hope you enjoyed it, and uh, thank you for giving me a chance to talk about it. I'm going to quickly pull up your page here, just if anybody wants to see it, and so we'll go into the, the archive as well. Yes, Darcy, uh, go ahead. We've been trying to work with the presenter, and we're not having a whole lot of um, successful communication. Uh, unfortunately, and that was a lot of the trouble that happened even then, is just we weren't hearing anything in return. We haven't given up hope, and we are trying to set something up, but that's unfortunately where it's at right now. <laughs>